The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. I'm thinking this will probably be a good place for this uh, presentation to follow Tom's because uh, I'm also talking about some urban uh, pavement scenarios and in this case concrete overlays. And concrete overlays have over the last few decades begun to be quite popular in many urban settings and in my own experience I've had the opportunity to kind of follow these and study these and kind of even be a part of quite a few of them over the last 30 years. And they seem to, as I travel around, I see concrete overlays all over the country, and they seem to have some local flair and some local preferences and tendencies, you might say. Where I'm from, the state of Mississippi, I've been able to follow these in Mississippi and neighboring states, so I'm just going to kind of touch in on a few of the things that we've seen happening in our part of the world. In general, concrete overlays have through the years, and they've been promoted heavily by the industry in the last uh, 20, 30 years, have had several different terminology things applied, and they've often been referred to as white topping, kind of interesting coin term. And there have been a few other descriptive terms, including things like thin white topping, ultra thin white topping, conventional white topping, and all of these had some industry defined definitions based generally on whether there was any intent to bond the concrete to the underlying layer, and this, what I'm talking about here, of course, is asphalt, or whether the concrete itself was in the composite pavement contributing significantly to the load carrying ability of the pavement. In the case of bonded concrete overlays, we are going to some trouble to actually accomplish a significant level of bond between the concrete and the underlying asphalt for several reasons. And in many cases, particularly the very thin concrete overlays, the concrete may not actually be designed as a load carrying layer per se, so much as just serving as a wearing course for an otherwise structurally adequate asphalt pavement that may have surface deformation issues from rutting, shoving near intersections and that sort of thing. And these are often constructed in an inlay configuration where we go in and mill out the asphalt and then prepare the surface for bond and place the concrete. There are some, I'm not really talking about design as part of this, it is a pavement construction session, but there are some very good resources out there. These are just a few of them, including one ACI 325 document that I would encourage you to avail yourself of for uh, design of concrete overlays of various types. I'm going to talk a little bit more later on about the first one here, which is very interesting, and it's a available by free download, by the way. To start with, before we get into the, the nuances of bonded concrete overlay construction, in the beginning, concrete overlay of asphalt, which the industry later termed conventional white topping, was essentially the, just designing a new concrete pavement that happened to be constructed over asphalt. And the asphalt, in many cases, would have to be repaired, local repairs before proceeding, but the asphalt basically just served as a slightly higher quality subgrade material for placement of a conventional concrete pavement. That's pretty much the scenario. The method is not new. As a matter of fact, Portland Cement Association first documented it in 1926, and there's been quite a number of projects in places like, especially the state of Iowa, that a lot of county roads were overlaid with concrete in the early days. And these were all pretty much conventional new concrete pavement construction over existing asphalt. And here's how that scenario looks. This is actually from some of the county roads in Iowa, I believe. This is a uh, large parking lot in uh, Salt Lake City that was done way back in the 80s. And just conventional type, there's a few scenarios where we're doing some special things like trying to match grades in the new concrete overlay with sidewalks and things. Sometimes that's done with some excavation and grading and other times we actually do make essentially a shallow roll curb from a step curb scenario. A lot of times we're attaching the forms to the asphalt subgrade in a slightly different way than we would in a natural subgrade. But it's basically just construction of a new concrete pavement 
over a flexible pavement system. There's a lot of benefits to doing concrete overlays over asphalt. Of course, we are doing something that is quite sustainable when you consider all the different pavement repair options in the urban arena because we're not going to the expense of taking out the asphalt, removing the materials and transporting it somewhere and redoing things. So we're taking the maximum advantage really of all the different resources that are there and in place. It's an economical way to enhance the capacity of a pavement section at the time when, by the way, it needs rehabilitation anyway. And it's often done with the idea of reducing the future maintenance expenses for that particular street, roadway, or parking area. Tom mentioned the uh, illumination type issues and energy efficiency and safety uh, of concrete surfaces. That's certainly an advantage and the aesthetics and the curb appeal for your project are other advantages. But what's different when we move from conventional type concrete overlays to bonded concrete overlays over asphalt? Well, the typical scenarios for these type of projects are typically urban streets and especially intersections where there might be rutting and shoving of asphalt that's a recurring problem and the agency is having to repair, resurface, very frequent basis, spending a lot of money keeping up the pavement near the intersection. And in these cases, concrete can be actually a relatively thin wearing course without really giving it consideration for a significant component of the load carrying ability of the pavement. As long as the bond is quite good and as long as there are several other particular points adhered to in the planning. And these of course do rely on the asphalt pavement structure for carrying the loads pretty much. Concrete is a new durable wearing surface. And there is attention to the bond that's paid that's quite important for several reasons and that does allow thinner concrete sections. Now in the very beginning of what the industry came to know as ultra thin white topping, I think we're kind of getting away from those terms these days, some of these were quite thin. Gosh, 25, 28 years ago, I can remember that some of the early ones were even an inch and a half to two inches of concrete with very high doses of synthetic fibers and things like that. I think over time they've evolved to more like a typical thin section of three, three and a half inches is probably more representative today. There are very close joint spacings for these type of bonded overlays and that not only accomplishes crack control as joints normally do, but it's very important in these type systems to minimize panel size so that the bond remains intact without a significant amount of curling. The curling of a slab can actually start debonding the panel at the corners. So that's one reason that the joints are quite close. Again, there's commonly synthetic fibers used and often at maybe three times a normal dosage rate, a lot of advantage to fibers in these kinds of applications. The scenario for construction is often fast track type construction with traffic control arranged so that we can open in hours versus days and maintain traffic on the roadway, the intersection, and it's not an inexpensive type of pavement designed for construction because of all the joints, all expensive traffic control, but the economic justification is often because of the trade-off in postponing maintenance. Some of these facilities, these intersections may have been overlaid in frequencies of months rather than years, and if you can move that section out to a 10-year lifespan even, then all of a sudden you've really accomplished something from the standpoint of total expenses. The construction process, Many times there will actually be, and you know, the traffic control is a very significant part of the project in many cases. I've mentioned the milling and the inlay. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Cleaning of the surface after milling. After that, it's somewhat traditional, doing everything as you would imagine on a rapid, fast track type project. And some of these projects are open in less than 24 hours, but 24 to 48 hours is certainly plenty doable with this type of construction. Many times we're using just very simple placement techniques, screeds of different types, using either an inlay geometry or in some cases a temporary form that's set for screed rails. And you can see uh, the sequencing of some of that type of construction here. The milling and the cleaning is a very important part because that's the primary tool in the toolbox for really capturing the high level of bond between concrete and asphalt. This rough mill surface has a lot of surface area. Then we want to clean it with either pressure washing or very thorough sweeping and stuff. 
There's a lot of very technical terms involved here. If you've got a rutted pavement, then you've got a hump between the ruts, right? And a lot of times we'll actually take off the hump first and then do our profiling to see how much more we're going to mill and what our surface grades will end up being. At the end of the milling run, where you've got a section of that needs to be squared up with hand tools. So there's a little bit of hand work to be done along the way, but the milling and cleaning is very critical. And here's a close-up of what the mill surface looks like. That asphalt surface is now clean, high surface area, irregularly shaped, really good for concrete bond, especially after a pressure washing or something like that. So that's important. <laughs> And here you can see we're actually milling all the way up to an existing concrete curb and gutter. We'll do a little hand cleaning along there and use the concrete gutter as part of our screed rail system. A lot of joints to cut, and most of the joints for many of these projects are cut with the early entry type saws, the dry cut early entry saws, not only for the benefit of being able to get in very early, but that is important here, but also the early entry saws do a great job at being able to make a very thin kerf cut with minimal aggregate kick out along the saw cut, and that's important. We don't usually plan to seal joints in these type projects, so the very thin curve for the saw joint is a benefit as compared with a wider cut. So not so many of these old wet cut saws anymore. It's all the dry cut early entries that we see out there. Oftentimes we're sawing the depth of the overlay more like a third to a half of its thickness, not only for crack control, but to you know, these are thin sections anyway, so just it's not difficult to saw that deep. The curing following placement and finishing is often, it may be ordinary curing that we're familiar with, curing compounds, but especially seasonally when we get into cooler weather, it may be necessary to use insulated curing blankets to assure that the pavement strength develops in time for the opening to early traffic. And of course, we now have maturity methods and things to assist us there. I thought I'd conclude with just showing a few projects from where I live, the kinds of things that we've done over the period of now 20 years or so. And I'll, starting with the first one that was done in the state of Mississippi, and it is almost 20 years old right now. And we actually learned quite a bit from this project. It's done in uh, October of 1996. This was done with Mississippi DOT equipment for milling. Uh, there was a subcontractor that came into place and finished the concrete, used some temporary forms in some places, and the actual profile of the inlay milling for screed rails in other places. Conventional concrete placement and finishing at County Line Road along I-55 frontage roads in Jackson, Mississippi. And this is what that concrete looks like today, almost 20 years later. It's been untouched since that time. DOT was having a lot of rutting problems with its asphalt at the intersections there. If you really look close, you can see that the most problematic areas are, of course, the asphalt that adjoins the concrete it tends to still rut, and that interface is kind of difficult to manage sometimes. Maybe we could have carried the concrete overlay, inlay as it were, a little further. Now traffic backs up at the intersection further than it did 20 years ago. Another thing that's kind of interesting, if you look at the joints, now they mismatch where you've seen some traffic, some sliding of the panels toward the intersection from braking forces. And that's another thing that, as you think about this, and shoot from the hip type solution might be to try to anchor those lead panels a little better to the subgrade and everything to prevent that sliding. But that is one thing that we do see happening, some of these. Mississippi DOT was real pleased with that project and has followed up with projects all over the state of Mississippi now, all very similar in construction. And again, the joining, this is about three and a half inches thick, by the way, with joining three feet on center each direction. Kind of baseline sort of what we're seeing in most of the Deep South for these types of projects. The state of Tennessee has done a lot of this, too. A number of years ago now, the flexible pavement system along US 78 in a kind of an industrial part southeast of Memphis a lot of rutting problems, especially as the, you approach the intersections in that major highway. A lot of truck traffic on that highway and then industrial areas. And Tennessee started doing some systematic thin bonded concrete overlays in this area using the same type techniques that we just looked at. Very simple placement techniques and it's been very successful. There's been a number of small towns around the southeast where there's actually been more extensive urban paving using this technique, including this is South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, the main street through town is now kind of a thin bonded concrete overlay. Main street of Jasper, Tennessee, similar situation. And the close joint spacings kind of pick up the sidewalk joints really nice and make for a nice aesthetic reflection. 
Here's a small general aviation airport runway, a bonded concrete overlay of the asphalt was used for that. And this is one that I find particularly interesting. This is the city of New Orleans. Probably everybody here has visited New Orleans and experienced an evening in the French Quarter, and you may recall the traffic nightmares in the French Quarter. Well, if you can do bonded concrete overlay of asphalt in the New Orleans French Quarter, I would suggest you can do it just about anywhere. This is a pretty significant project. Two of the main streets in the French Quarter that are heavy traffic streets where the trucks tend to deliver supplies. In one case, the two streets are Iberville Street and Julia Street. Iberville Street is the artery that goes right along behind the major hotels on Canal Street in the French Quarter proper. And it's the street that the trucks come and deliver the foodstuffs and other supplies to the hotels every day. So there's a lot of truck traffic on that street. Julia Street is out of the French Quarter proper, just a few blocks in the warehouse district. And it's the street that serves the cruise port on the Mississippi River. So all the trucks, the traffic back and forth to the cruise port there, very heavy traffic situation. And significant portion of the project was in the concrete part, but the rest of it was appurtenances, including things like the historic light post and the whole nine yards. This is what Iberville and Julia Streets looked like prior to the projects. They were a mess. The asphalt had been patched over and over for years, and it was a real eyesore for the city. The construction was not unlike the other views that you saw, except that in this heavily congested urban area, the challenges were really not only traffic control, but coordination with the local businesses and residents and making sure that everybody was in on the information that was available, the schedule, and so forth. And with one or two minor exceptions, they actually did not close any of these streets through the entire process. They had one-way directed traffic on some of these streets and adjacent streets during the entire project. So a major, major undertaking. I heard the New Orleans Public Works Director give this presentation at a conference, and I got some of these slides from him. And the city was really pleased with how this turned out. And everybody else in the area wants their concrete street now. Obviously, finding funds for that will be a challenge, but the project's turned out quite well. Here's some views of the finished product. This is Julia Street. Looking down the street at one of the major intersections, you can see the joint spacing. Again, it's about nominally three, three and a half inches in most places in thickness and about a three-foot joint spacing in each direction. And this is the Google map view of Iberville Street. And next time you're in the French Quarter in New Orleans at a meeting or a convention or something, take time to walk a block or two down Iberville Street. It's a very prevalent street there, just a block or two off Canal. It's really turned out nice. One other project that's kind of interesting, and I wanted to show this one because it's not a thin project. I'm not sure the design of this conformed to some of the uh, engineer design resources that we have available now, but this one was done by the Mississippi Department of Transportation on a truck way scale ramp along US 78 near Olive Branch, Mississippi, 1999. You can see the rutting in the asphalt ramp there was so significant. MDOT, of course, this is just trucks, heavy truck traffic, and a lot of it. So the design, if you call it that, I think it was more or less just selection of a thickness, was done basically for shoot from the hip, and they went with, as I recall, about seven inches of thickness. But this was essentially very similar. The panels are much larger, so half the lane width, joint spacing, and the same type techniques. But the project turned out quite nice, and there's a finished view of the way scale ramp. In conclusion, I'll mention this one resource again because this one is particularly interesting to me. It's available as a free download to anybody that would like to order it. It was produced by the CP Tech Center in cooperation with the RMC Foundation, and it really has a very complete approach to evaluating what's in place with the asphalt pavement and to considering that, making best use of it, making the right selection for all the protocols going forward, the design, and the most complete reference of its type that I've seen, very easily used as well.